Kutyo. The President, uh, please be seated. The court is now back in session. Now we would like to hand over to the co-prosecutor to continue putting questions for Mr. Hedda. You may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Mr. Hedda, I'd like you please to go to file three. Tab one. I hope you have a document E three slash three one six nine. Nineteen ninety one publication Pol Pot and Q Sampon. Can you confirm that you have that document, please? Uh, I've got one not with an E number, but with a D number, but it's that document, I think. D number was D366-7.1.14. Now, described as a, a, a paper, but can you explain what stage you were in your academic career or what was going on um, academically in your life when you began your research which led to the publication of the book and the publication of the book time in 1991. Um, yes, as it says in the first footnote, this was done primarily while I was a research fellow at the Australian National University. It included some stuff that I had gathered at previous points in my academic career, but the, uh, the, the bulk of the research and the writing was done while I was at the, uh, at the Australian National University. Thank you. I'd like to start, please, on using the pages in the top right hand of each page to page uh, seven. This is English ERN 0008 seven seven one. Khmer 0071137. And French zero zero seven two two zero seven one, and it's on the topic of intellectuals. And you write retrospectively, Michael Vickery has also reported how Cambodian intellectuals were lulled into a false sense of security about the Communist Party of Kampuchea's intentions by Q. Sompon's contrived prominence. He writes that one teacher he interviewed after the party's rule was overthrown on the 7th of January 1979 told him that up to 1975 he had sympathized with the revolutionaries and in particular admired Q. Sompon. He therefore had confidence for the moment in the rationality of Communist Party of Kampuchea actions and in particular felt no fear or apprehension about the future. And you reference there Michael Vickery, Cambodia, 1975 to 1982. Um, again, just a little bit, Michael Vickery, connection with him, how you got this to be a footnote in the paper. Um, Michael Vickery is a very veteran historian of Cambodia whose earlier, who, who's, whose 
primary work is on pre-modern Cambodia, but is also written rather extensively on contemporary politics. And this is just a, a, a published book by, by Michael. And reading on on the same page, same ERNs, under a heading Q. Sampon and the, quote, liberation, close quote. In what appears to have been a calculated abuse of trust in which he was held, Q. Sampon actively helped just before the end of the war to set up Lon Nol military personnel and civil servants for easy execution. The esteem in which he was held meant that some of them allowed themselves to become sitting ducks for murder. Thus, as the Communist Party of Kampuchea advanced towards an all-out military victory during the first four months of 1975, Q. Sampon twice signaled those who had been fighting against it that only the seven top leaders amongst them would be executed upon defeat. And footnote 25 lists, uh, lists the people, and you carry on. On the 24th to 25th of February, Q. Sampon chaired the Second National Congress, a meeting of members of Grunk who resided inside the country and 273 representatives of Funk associations and the army. The Congress declared that the seven traitors must die but that other high-ranking Khmer Republic personalities could join the Sihanouk side. Then, on the 1st of April, a little more than two weeks before Phnom Penh was captured, Q. Sampon spoke in a live broadcast over the Communist Party-run radio. He attacked the seven traitors by name, but appealed to the officers and men of the Khmer Republic Armed Forces to lay down their arms and join the Sihanouk side. You're referencing there the chairing of the Second Congress and then a broadcast on the 1st of April. Can I ask, first of all, about the 1st of April broadcast? Um, there's not a specific footnote to do with that. Can you remember what source material you were looking at in, res in respect of the 1st of April 1975 broadcast or was, were you in Cambodia at that time? Did you hear it? How does that appear in the paper? Um, well, the, the footnote as you see is to a chronology done by Tim Carney who was at the time a political officer in the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh. Um, and I relied on that, I think, for this particular piece of work because where I was at the time at, at the Australian National University, they did not have um, a complete set of the Foreign Broadcast Information Service translations of, uh, of, of radio, public radio broadcasts. Um, I was in Cambodia on the 1st of April. Um, we didn't in those days have access to the daily, the, the FBIS daily report, but the embassy did make available the teletype version of those uh, broadcasts, um, and I read those every, every day. So I, I'm, I can be fairly certain I read it at the time, but I didn't have that piece of paper in hand when I wrote this particular piece. So instead, I relied upon Carney's chronology, which was based on those FBIS translations. And so we're clear, what we all call the FIBIS, yeah. Foreign Broadcast Information Service Papers, you did re read those at the time back in 1975, uh, but they weren't available to you when you were writing this paper. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. I just want to ask a question about these FIBIS broadcasts. I mean, uh, this particular broadcast is E3 slash 118. But I just want to get a picture, really, about how regularly these broadcasts were coming out and how you were able to be reading the FIBIS material. 
Do you understand the question? Um, the, the U.S. government personnel who did the monitoring of these broadcasts uh, were based in Thailand. And they sat and listened to these broadcasts, recorded them, and then did translations. Um, and what would happen then would be that the translations would be transmitted to U.S. embassies around the world in a kind of teletype form. Um, and those were, those teletype translations were considered public documents uh, within the U.S. government system. Um, so one could go every day, as I did, not every day, but in order, uh, often enough that I could read every day's output to a reading room in the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh uh, to see what Phibis had translated. And then some but not all of those teletype translations were, would then be compiled into the so-called daily report, which was a semi, was a, a kind of in a magazine format, and which was deposited in a number of libraries around the world, not Australian <coughs> National University, but certainly Cornell had them. There's also a British version, as you know, which is a carbon copy as far as Cambodia is concerned, so-called summary of world broadcasts, which had even fewer items in it, but essentially it was the same text. I just want to ask a question about that. I know what you're speaking about, but I just want it explained for the judges. Certain documents on the case file are FIBIS broadcasts, and then there's a copy of the same material, but with SWB in the top, Hence, that's, I think, what you're, you're aiming at, is that correct? Now, I think you said that you came to Cambodia in 1973, is that correct? Uh, yeah, first time in 1969, but only to pass through to work um, in 73. Can I ask, um, was this in the capacity as a journalist, a reporter, or if you like, what was the reason, purpose, background to you coming to Cambodia in 1973? Um, I had finished my bachelor's degree at Cornell in Asian Studies. Um, I wanted to be a journalist. Um, in fact, I went first to Hong Kong and then to Bangkok to try and make my living as a journalist working on China or on Thailand. In Hong Kong, there was too much competition. In Thailand, there was no story. So uh, uh, a kindly veteran journalist in Bangkok said, you should go to Cambodia uh, because there's not a lot of competition uh, and there's a story there that virtually writes itself. So I followed that advice. And my recollection is that I arrived in Cambodia in, in May of 73. Can you remember what the first couple of events were that you reported on? Um, well, the, the, the big story at that juncture was the fact that um, U.S. Congress had um, passed, I guess, what was a law, um, ordering an end to U.S. bombing of Cambodia. And the cutoff date for that end was 15 August 1973. Um, and there was a widespread expectation that as soon as the American bombing ended, uh, the Khmer Rouge would march into Phnom Penh. The Khmer Republic regime would collapse. Um, and that was, from my perspective, professionally speaking, both good news and bad news. Um, it was bad news in the sense that a whole bunch of high-powered staff correspondents from 
big news organizations came to Phnom Penh to sit around and wait for the Khmer Rouge to, to appear, um, sort of blocking my entry into Stringerdom. Stringer is a person who works for a news organization, doesn't have a real job. Uh, but the good news was there were a lot of those people, they needed help, uh, so I did stringing, and I started out with, with a kind of an assistant position, um, a fixer position, if you will, and I started out doing that uh, with uh, NBC, uh, which it was at that time a television and radio network, uh, and Time magazine, which was a weekly news magazine. And then, you know, the Khmer Rouge didn't come, um, and the big-time journalists left, um, so sort of the story fell to those of us who, re who remained behind. I just want you to try and paint a picture about sort of journalism world, 1973 stroke 1974. Now, what I mean by that is, what was the extent of the contact between the members of the journalistic reporting community in Cambodia? Can you give us a feel of sort of how many people were regularly reporting? And sort of who was going out in, into the field? Do you understand what I mean by into the field? Just try and paint a picture, can you please, of the sort of world you were in and the sort of people you were with. Um, there were there were kind of two tiers. There were the staff correspondents for the existing news agencies, um, most of whom were older, uh, many of whom had been previously in Vietnam, sort of veteran war correspondents, if you will. Um, and then there was there was a group of us who were relatively younger. Um, and I was in the, the, the relatively younger group. Um, uh, however, one of the older journalists, a guy by the name of Neil Davis, um, Australian um, cinematographer, television reporter, uh, and also print reporter, uh, kind of took me under his wing, and gave me a lot of assistance, so I spent a lot of time with him. There was also a young Japanese photographer, Naoki Mabuchi, now deceased. Neil Davis is also dead, um, with whom I spent a lot of time. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time also with a Japanese journalist by the name of Koki, uh, who worked for Kyoto, um, and also sometimes, quite a bit of time, um, with Elizabeth Becker, who was um, then, I believe, with the Washington Post. Um, when the story was big, somebody would come from Hong Kong or Saigon, and we, would, we youngsters would tag along. Uh, when the story was relatively quiet, then we would be left on our own. Um, and I sort of gradually made my way from a very, I, sort of very periodic stringer work to pretty solid stringer work enough to make a living on. Uh, I was asking about into the field. Did you become an into the field reporter, or what you might call an office person sat in the center? What was your modus operandi? Um, I wasn't as in the field as some of the most forward war horses. Um, I did spend some time in the field, um, in the battlefield, um, around the, in the perimeter area around Phnom Penh, went to Udong, as I explained, went up to Battambang. Um, I also, however, having done the BA, spent a little bit of time doing research in the National Library because I was interested in the sort of the political historical background of the Khmer Rouge. So 
their origins in the 1940s and the 1950s. So I did some archival work. I did some field work um, in the battlefield, and I did some work in the sort of in the in the Khmer Republic political scene in Phnom Penh. Thank you. You mentioned American bombing, 15th of August, 1973. Did you see? Did others tell you? Was there information coming about continued bombing well beyond that date or just beyond that date? American bombing. No, at, 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 at that point, uh, the, 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 U, the U.S. Air Force bombing completely ended. There was no more. Uh, however, the, the Khmer Republic Armed Forces uh, Air Force bombing continued, as did the shelling done by the Khmer Republic ground troops. I'm going to ask you some more, some more questions about this later, but... I, don't want, I can't go through day by day, obviously, every day that you were here, but can I ask the question this way, and you tell me if it doesn't help the way I ask. You arrive in May 1973, is that correct? And I think you said you left in April 1975, but I can't remember the date in April. Can you please clarify? Yes, it was the 11th of April, and Neil Davis, who I just mentioned, and I uh, flew out with the American evacuation of its personnel and U.S. citizens and others who wanted to or managed to go along with them. I want to ask you about battlefields from May 1973 to the 11th of April 1975, with this specific question in mind. Did you yourself see, or did others tell you, or was information coming to you, you can help at all, about what was happening, if it was happening, to captured Lon Nol soldiers? And what I mean by that is Lon Nol soldiers who were taken into the custody of, I call it broadly, Khmer Rouge forces, CPN, LAF, and so on. Can you help on this or not? I think the answer has to be no, not off the top of my head. There may be stuff in my notebooks, but I, I don't have any spe specific recollection that I can give you now. You've spoken about one event, 15th of August, 1973. Can I ask you to try and distill what the next one or two important events were that you remember reporting on? Do you understand the question? anti-Lonnol demonstrations in Phnom Penh, um, including an incident in which two government ministers were killed. Um, the big offensive that was launched against Phnom Penh on the 1st of January 1975, um, and the, all of the subsequent battles on the perimeter of Phnom Penh as the Khmer Rouge closed in. Um, and then up to and including the last reports which were on the American evacuation of Phnom Penh. That is, American evacuation of U.S. personnel and, and others who wanted to or managed to go along. Now, in this period, were you living most of the time in Phnom Penh if you weren't out in the field, or were you moving around the country regularly? Uh, 
Uh, no, I lived in Phnom Penh initially on the south west side of the city, the outskirts of Phnom Penh on the southwest side. Uh, I moved out of there because we took a lot of incoming Khmer Rouge 105 shell, shelling uh, to the center of town to be away from the 105 shelling coming from the southwest and the 107 rockets coming from the east. So I set myself up in the smack in the middle of town to avoid the incoming. Again, one of those paint the picture questions. What I mean by this is you're living in Phnom Penh. You've got shells coming in. How regularly, how frightened or not, just give us a bit of a feeling. You're in a house in Phnom Penh or somewhere and shells are coming in. Just bring this to life, please. You sound like my Time magazine editors. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, it was, it was certainly scary to be under shell fire when, we, when, when I lived on the southwest side of town. Um, I, I had to dig a bunker under my house, and sometimes live in the bunker, learn how many meters of dirt I needed to have on top of me to prevent the 105 shells from coming in. Um, similarly, when the rockets were coming in from the east, one could sit on what's now the waterfront and hear those rockets being fired and see them coming in open, over our heads normally uh, and then landing in the center of town uh, around Monorome, people being killed. Um, and the city was also, you know, the, the socioeconomic situation in the city was very fraught, very tense. As, as everybody knows, there were a lot of people who come in from the countryside, who were in Phnom Penh. Um, the, uh, the political situation was primarily anti-government, uh, particularly among students, sort of a classic, classic revolutionary situation, if you will. The students and the workers were anti-government. Uh, the middle class, such as it was, and it was very tiny, uh, was mostly also anti-government. Um, and this sort of leads into some of the stuff that's referred to in, 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 in the document that was the beginning of this discussion. Um, I mean, I think I, I refer in, the, in, 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 this, in, in this document, I, uh, it's been a while since I looked at it, refer in this document to an unpublished Time magazine story I did about the Khmer Rouge leadership. Um, there was another story I was asked to do which never got published. Maybe there weren't enough atmospherics. Um, and that was simply what people in Phnom Penh thought was going to happen when the Khmer Rouge came in. Um, and this was in the context of, uh, of a time in which there was an enormous debate going on in the United States, um, focused primarily on Vietnam, to which Cambodia was, of course, famously only a sideshow, about whether or not when the communists won, which by April 75 seemed inevitable, uh, whether or not there would be a bloodbath. Uh, so my editors asked me to write a story about whether or not, well, whether Cambodians in Phnom Penh thought there would be a bloodbath or not. Um, and part of the background to the thinking that's in this piece um, is that for the most part people thought no. People said no. Um, and indeed, one of the main, or one of the several reasons why people thought that uh, was that they believed that the Khmer Rouge were led by Kyo Sun Pan, Hu Nim, Hu Yun, whom many people, liberals and leftists alike, uh, thought were good, honest, patriotic, 
uh, people who would uh, do well by the country and do well by the population. Um, there was a kind of general sense already then that the Khmer Rouge were somehow different. Um, and there was a, an alternative view, which was that they were different but worse than other communists. And I remember one relatively sophisticated intellectual to whom I spoke about this matter who said, you know, the question is not whether the Khmer Rouge will be sort of different, but whether they will be different in a kind of Yugoslavian way, that is to say relatively moderate for communists, or an Albania kind of way, that is to say relatively radical uh, in terms of their communism. And the general opinion seemed to be the former, they would be relatively moderate. Um, so that was the widespread perception, the relatively widespread perception. The story never saw the light of day. Two questions. May sound to you like a silly question. When you're in your dugout that you've had to make and you've got rockets coming in from two different directions, who were firing the rockets and how did you find out that? Um, the artillery fire, the 105 fire, came from the special zone troops commanded by Knott, Imlon alias Knott, um, and the 107s coming from the east were being fired by East Zone Division 1 or maybe 2 troops. Um, and I knew that at the time um, from things I was told by the Japanese military attaché who was very well informed and rather free with this information and shared his order of battle information with me. In terms of the effect of the shelling, was it only residential buildings or were other buildings, I don't know, schools, hospitals, factories, were they subject to shelling or not? Um, all of this shelling, whether artillery fire or rocket fire, I would describe as indiscriminate in the sense that it, it fell primarily in, in residential areas. Uh, the worst resulting incident was uh, happened because there was incoming fire into a neighborhood where there were lots of people who made their living by selling gasoline and bottles along the streets, which is a practice that continued in Cambodia up until fairly recently. It's now sort of part of the historical footnote. But the, the, the incoming fire that went into this neighborhood ignited some of these gasoline stores, and the whole neighborhood went up in flames. Uh, which part of Phnom Penh, the gasoline going up in flames? West side, west side. Now I know it's perhaps obvious, but you said that the 105s came from the special zone commanded by In Lawn alias Nat, and the 107 millimeters from the east were by the East Zone Division One. Whose troops or what troops? I don't mean overall. Under what global command? Overall command. Uh, these are Khmer Rouge zonal divisions operating under the overall direction of the general staff, which it was at this time 
uh, chaired by, already chaired by Sun Sen, and answered to a military command post uh, headed by Pol Pot. The President, Mr. Prosecutor, please hold on. Mr. Coupe, you may proceed. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, it, mm, it appears to me, or it might appear, that there is a, um, a mixture going on of eyewitness testimony of the witness of what he saw incoming in 75 and the filling in later uh, of information as to who was commanding these various troops. Now, under your ruling, both are admissible. Um, I understand that, but I think it's, it would be good to make that distinction while we have uh, the present testimony going on. I agree with Maloney, friend. That's uh, absolutely right. Back in 1975, when it was, when the shelling was going on, well, let's, let's make that the first question to clarify this. Can you help us when you first directly became aware of shelling that was affecting you or affecting Phnom Penh generally? What year, what month, or can you only be general in this respect? Probably dry season of 73, 74, um, but in a bigger way than initially, in a bigger way in the dry season of 74, 75, that is to say starting in late 73 and running into the early part of 74 and then again start, starting again in late 74 and then running into early 75, and then continuously from early 75 right up to January, I'm oh, sorry, April 75. Now, you've said something about the troops who were shelling. You've mentioned a Japanese attache, and you were saying that was the source for where they were coming from. Can we clarify that, first of all? Is that correct? Uh, yes, there was the order of battle information that was shared with me by the Japanese military attaché, whose source was undoubtedly the Khmer Republic military intelligence. Um, there was also some material, again, originating with um, FANC, the Khmer, Khmer, Khmer Republic military and civilian intelligence, which was early um, organograms, organizational charts um, prepared on, prepared by either, by Khmer Republic in intelligence, either military or civilian, about the structure and organization of the Khmer Rouge, both political and military. Um, which identify leaders of certain political administrative areas uh, and associated particular military units with named commanders with those political administrative units. So the basic sort of outline of Khmer Rouge structure and organization, the center, the zones, the sectors, and so on, uh, was already known in what turned out, it seems, to have been reasonably accurate detail by Khmer Republic military and civilian intelligence. That was then passed on not only to the Japanese, uh, but also to the Americans. And I got some of that, I was leaked some of that information by people in the U.S. Embassy. I want to ask questions about two documents or two nature of documents, an order of battle, and an organogram. 
you say that information was leaked to you by the US Embassy. You've mentioned sectors, districts and the like, but in terms of the question I'd asked earlier, you were talking about a military structure. And you mentioned two commanders whose names I can't remember now. Uh, in Lawn, alias Nat. And then you said something about Son Sen, and you mentioned another person as well. Can I ask this? From the order of battle material, or the organogram material, can you remember whose name was at the top of either or both documents, or whose name was next down? Or, if it helps, go upwards from the commander you mentioned. some of these materials Sulatsar was at the top um, and that was something which uh, there was some dispute within the intelligence community about who he was and how accurate that was uh, but after the uh, reporting done by But Sarin, um, who had been in the, on the fringes of the party apparatus and then defected to the Khmer Republic side, did some reports for Khmer Republic intelligence and then published a book where he identified Salazar as the head of the communist movement. That was pretty much accepted uh, in the intelligence community. Um, for not... Um, as it was the special zone, um, my recollection is in those days, Vorn Vet was identified as the head of the special zone, but by one of his other aliases, I think Sok Tuk, the alias used in the documents. Um, certainly, Damok was mentioned. Um, in the east, certainly, Sal Pum was mentioned as the head of the, the zone, I think by his, one of his, one of his aliases, uh, Vana, so Vana, Sal Vana. Um, and the, the other zone secretaries, for the most part, were accurately identified. Nyum in the, Nyum in the northeast, uh, sorry, northwest, um, and so on. So as I say, it was fairly, fairly accurate. Um, for, The President, it appears to us that uh, we have some technical issue regarding the mic. Uh, the console is too close uh, to Mr. Header. Perhaps you should turn it all the way to the west a little bit further, the console, so that uh, it's not too close to uh, Mr. Header. You may now proceed. Um, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Now, in terms of, uh, let's call it access to these orders of battle, organograms, the Japanese military attaché, um, did you have more or less access than other reporters? Were you in a special position? Was this generally available? Can you help on that question, please? Um, I don't really know what the competition had. Um, I think there were there were some people in some embassies who seemed to appreciate the fact that I was a bit of an archive rat that I was looking into the background and the history and so on of these 
uh, of these movements and the, the movements that gave rise to the to the Khmer Rouge. So those in the embassies who had a kind of interest in history, uh, I think maybe were more sympathetic to me than they might have been to some of the other journalists who didn't appear to, to them to have that sort of characteristic. But I, I don't know what other people saw. And I didn't, didn't pass it on to my colleagues. So I, I, I don't know whether they already had more than me or not. Now, you mentioned some broadcasts earlier in your testimony in the sense of the phrase, dry up the people from the enemy. But I want to ask about broadcasts during the time from May 1973, when you arrived, up to the 11th of April 1975, when you left. Now, what I mean by broadcasts is broadcasts by or on behalf of, calling it as broadly as I can, the front. Now again, without sounding like one of your news editors, can you bring this to life in terms of how often these broadcasts were, what sorts of subjects they covered, where the radio was if you listened to them, whether you listened to them on your own or whether with other journalists, but how did these broadcasts, if there were broadcasts, feature in your life? Um, I listen, as, in some ways, just as part of my language study, increasingly to the Khmer broadcast, Khmer language broadcast, and my recollection is there was an early morning broadcast <coughs> and there was an early evening broadcast. Um, and a lot of this was battlefield reporting. We have attacked here, we have liberated this, we have seized that. Um, and then occasionally there, was, there were policy broadcasts describing you know, what, what the policies were in the, in the liberated zones and what the overall aims and objectives of the revolution, which of course at this time wasn't called the revolution, um, were going to be. Uh, but I relied in some ways, it was easier. I mean, it was easier just to read the Phibis, frankly. Uh, everything was translated for you. It was all there. Didn't have to struggle with a dictionary or any of that stuff. So I didn't listen to it all that much. I listened to it a bit. Uh, when you listened to it a bit, can you remember? I mean, was there like a radio station or a radio? Uh, did it, was it clear from the announcer who was making these announcements, and were you able to find out where the broadcast transmitter was, or locations for such transmissions? I, I think the answer to that is no. I mean, I do vaguely recall there was a point in time where there was a second, uh, a second broadcast system which called itself the, the voice of funk for Phnom Penh. Um, and that came on air, I think, after I arrived. Prior to that, it was something else. Uh, but I, I, didn't, I didn't delve into the, where the broadcasts were actually coming from. Occasionally, there were broadcasts that were presented as being in the voice of Kyo Sun Pon or somebody else with a name but a lot of it was just by announcer, anonymous announcer. I want to concentrate on the broadcast by Q Sompon or in the name of Q Sompon. Can you tell us, you've mentioned talk of battlefields, you've mentioned talk of policy. Can you remember when there was a broadcast by Q Sompon or on behalf of Q Sompon did the subject matter differ from what you've just said, or can you elaborate? Um, frankly, not specifically, no. I mean, it's, it's all, and it's all jumbled up in my memory with my contemporaneous reading of the Phibis and my subsequent reading 
rereading, rereading, and rereading umpteen times of, of those broadcasts. I can't separate in my mind when when that information got into my head. In respect of the broadcasts by Q Sompon or on behalf of Q Sompon, I mean one, two, half a dozen, eight, ten, can't remember. What was the sort of number, just roughly, that you remember of such broadcasts? Maybe a dozen. I've taken you on a big side route from Pol Pot and Q Son Palm, which was document number E3 slash 3169. So can we return to that, Mr. Header, please? Just to remind you again, file 3, index 1. And we were on page 8. Same ERNs as previously given. Now, I asked you a specific question about the 1st of April, Q Sompong broadcast over commun Communist Party run radio. It was the information about Q Sompong chairing the Second National Congress. It may be a difficult question, but can you remember whether that was from a broadcast or FIBIS? Or can't you now say? Uh, I mean, this was a pretty big thing at the time, and I, I'm, I think I can say that I can remember reading the blue teletype Phibis version of this, of, of this reportage on this purported Congress sitting there in that U.S. Embassy reading room. Again on the uh, same document still, still the same page, so E3 slash 3169. <coughs> you started in the paper to talk about the Communist Party of Kampuchea's policy vis-a-vis -vis the officers and men of the defeated army and many of the Khmer Republic's civil servants. I don't think it's fair that I read the next words because the rest of the page was based largely on confessions. But on top of the next page, which is English 0008, 7773, French 007, 220072, and Khmer 007, 11379. On this topic, you said, there is also documentary evidence of the involvement in executions of a military unit that entered Phnom Penh from the special zone and which after the war was designated Division 703. This is in the form of an order signed by the Division Secretary to execute people mostly Khmer Republic Army officers in the division's custody. It's dated the 4th of June 1975, and it reads, all these 17 persons have been assessed by the party, and the party has decided they are to be exterminated. The comrades are asked to implement this policy of the party. And footnote 30, you'll see at the... Uh, bottom in the footnotes references PIN decision 4th of June 1975 and then a copy of this document was kindly provided to the author you by David Hawke. Again a little bit please about David Hawke and how you came into possession of this document. Um, David Hawke uh, was a executive director of Amnesty International United States section who um, 
after having left that post, uh, came to Southeast Asia, worked, I believe, for a religious NGO based out of Thailand, um, and developed an interest in what had happened in Cambodia, um, and set up something called the Cambodia Documentation Commission, uh, the objective of which was to try and gather evidence, if you will, um, in order to get a state's party to the Genocide Convention to take legal action against the then still UN recognized Democratic Kampuchea. In that, as part of that endeavor, uh, he visited Phnom Penh and visited S21, and this would be in the early 1980s, visited the Dulslang Genocide Museum, and uh, the, that document or a copy of that document was given to him by the curators of the Dulslang Genocide Museum, and then he showed it to me and asked me to translate it for him. So that's how I came into possession of that document. Thank you. Uh, same page in English. Khmer has moved on one, French the same. Heading. Q Sampon under Pol Pot in power. In May 1975, the Communist Party of Kampuchea held a congress and it confirmed Q Sampon's membership in the Central Committee. He remained a Central Committee member throughout the period that the Communist Party held power. But it is, uh, he is believed not to have been elevated to membership in the Standing Committee while the party was still in power. Although the exact composition of this seven to nine man body between 1975 and 1978 is still not known with complete certainty. Q. Sampon has never been identified as among the possible members. However, minutes of standing committee quora held in 1975 and 1976 reveal that he regularly attended them. It's the footnote in support of this, footnote 53, uh, sorry, 33, and you state the minutes of meetings of the Standing Committee, and then you give, I'll give the dates, 2nd November 1975, 22 February 1976, 11 March 1976, 17 May 1976, and 30 May 1976, all this Q. Sampon is present. These documents were kindly provided to the author by David Chandler. The point of the question here, Mr. Heder, is this. At this stage in, I think it's 1991 when you wrote this paper, you're mentioning here only five records of standing committee minutes showing attendance by Q. Sampon. So is it right that at this stage, when you were writing the paper, you'd only seen the five that you mention in the minutes, in the footnote 30. Um, I, the answer to that, I think, has to be, I guess. Um, I suppose that those were the ones that David Chandler had, passed, had at that point uh, passed on to me. Um, and I'd add, if I may, that the earlier part of that paragraph, the part about May 1975, uh, I would no longer hold to that view. Um, my subsequent uh, understanding of things is that what happened in May 1975 was not a Congress but a Central Committee meeting and that Kyosun Pond was not elevated at that May 75 gathering but not until January 76. And the footnote to it's not very good. So um, it's not surprising that it turns out to be wrong. OK. Um, you then go on talking about the anomaly of him not being a formal member of the standing committee but actually attending meetings. And you say this, uh, this anomaly 
must be viewed in the light of subsequent developments, particularly the purge by execution of standing committee members who were accused of being Vietnamese agents because Pol Pot knew or suspected that they opposed his policies and leadership. And at, at, 19, at, at footnote 34, you mention the people who that refers to. Is that correct? Uh, yes. From your research, interviews, consideration of documents, are you aware of any other persons who were members of the Central Committee attending standing committee meetings on a regular or frequent basis? The President, uh, Mr. Witness, could you please hold on? Council Kung Sam On, you may now proceed. Council Kung Sam On. Thank you, Mr. President. I take issue with this question. The confirmation from this witness regarding the presence of members of the Standing Committee. Uh, must be based on the research and study. A normal witness is not able to give testimony or confirmation regarding uh, this uh, uh, document or this information that needs uh, research to find out. I really take this issue with this. Uh, I understand my friend's uh, objection, and I'm, I'm just going to rephrase the question, I hope that deals with it. From factual sources, factual information, does any factual information indicate other persons who were members of the Central Committee attending Standing Committee meetings on a regular or frequent basis. Uh, the one who comes to mind is Suavasi alias Duan. Other than that, I can't immediately think of any. We'll come back to Duan in a minute. Same page, same ERNs. Just for the record, E3 slash 3169. Mr. Header, do you have this page open? It's page 10. Halfway down the page. As Q. Sampon himself later admitted, the opposition to Pol Pot was stronger even than in the Central Committee. In an interview with the author on the 4th of August 1980, he alleged that Khmer agents who were the Vietnamese infiltrated into the Central Committee didn't reach half of its membership, but in the standing committee, it was almost half. The first question is, is that what you've written in the book? And then I'm going to take you to another document. Well, yes, that's certainly what I've written in the book. Same file, tab six. The President, uh, Mr. Co-Prosecutor, could you please hold on and counsel Cope, you may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Just, <clears throat> sorry, a request for clarification. 
in my document it is always page nine that the quotes were from. Um, it's, it's just to um, uh, prevent confusion. Um, it, I have in front of me E3 slash 3169 ERN 0002754, but at the bottom it's page 9. I think it's the same document and another reference. Uh, if it helps, I've got E3 slash 3169 as the document, and then the page I'm on for the English ERN is 00087774. I think my learned friend, can he indicate if he's looking at one that appears in the published version, which was D366-7.1.14? As there are two versions on case map or the case file, there is the published version, which is quite black and quite grainy, <coughs> and then the better copy in plain black and white typescript is also available under... E3 slash 3169. Does that help? That, that, well, my ERN number is what I have in front of me, 00002754. So it's a completely different ERN number, but that still wouldn't explain the page 9, which seems to be part of the article itself. So, um, so this would indicate or would imply that there are two versions of the same article rather than two different ERN numbers uh, or uh, e-documents. There are two documents under the case file three E3 stroke 3169. I think my learned friend has this version. There's also this version on the case file, and it's much easier to read without the black graininess of this document. I'll make sure I give on every page now the ERNs. I, I, I think I have been doing, but uh, I'll try and help as much as I can. The President, uh, thank you, Mr. Co Prosecutor. Future is now appropriate moment for the adjournment. The Chamber will adjourn for 20 minutes. Court officer is now directed to assist uh, the witness during this adjournment and having returned at 3 o'clock. Sure.